The Club of Rome is still one of the most important foreign policy arms of the Committee of 300, the other being the Bilderbergers. It was put together in 1968 from hardcore members of the original Morgenthau Group on the basis of a telephone call made by the late Aurelio Pecce for a new and urgent drive to speed up the plans of the One World Government, now called the New World Order, although I prefer the former name. It is certainly a better job description than the New World Order, which is somewhat confusing as there have been several New World Orders before, but no One World Government. Pache's call was answered by the most subversive future planners drawn from the United States, France, Sweden, Britain, Switzerland, and Japan that could be mustered. During the period 1968 to 1972, the Club of Rome became a cohesive entity of new science scientists, globalists, future planners, and internationalists of every stripe. As one delegate put it, we became Joseph's coat of many colors. Pache's book, Human Quality, formed the basis of the doctrine adopted by NATO's political wing. The following is extracted from Dr. Pache's book, Human Quality. For the first time since the first millennium was approached in Christendom, large masses of people are really in suspense about the impending advent of something unknown which could change their collective fate entirely. Man does not know how to be a truly modern man. Man invented the story of the bad dragon, but if ever there was a bad dragon, it is man himself. Here we have the human paradox, man trapped by his extraordinary capacity and achievements, as in a quicksand, the more he uses his power, the more he needs it. We must never tire of repeating how foolish it is to equate the present profound pathological state and maladjustment of the entire human system to any cyclic crisis or passing circumstances. Since man has opened Pandora's box of new technologies, he has suffered uncontrolled human proliferation, the mania for growth, energy crises, actual or potential resource scarcities, degradation of environment, nuclear folly, and a host of related afflictions. This is identical to the program adopted by the much later fake environmentalist movement spawned by the same Club of Rome to blunt and turn back industrial development. Broadly, the anticipated counterprogram of the Club of Rome would cover inventing and disseminating post-industrialization ideas in the United States, coupled with the spread of counterculture movements such as drugs, rock, sex, hedonism, Satanism, witchcraft, and environmentalism. Tavistock Institute, Stanford Research Institute, and the Institute for Social Relations, in fact, the entire wide spectrum of research organizations in applied social psychiatry either had delegates on the board of the Club of Rome or acted as advisors and played a guiding role in NATO's attempt to adopt the Aquarian Conspiracy. The name, New World Order, is seen as something developed as a consequence of the Gulf War in 1991, whereas the One World Government is recognized as being centuries old. The New World Order is not new. It has been around and developing under one or another guise for a very long time, but it is perceived as a development of the future, which is not the case. The New World Order is past and present. That is why I said earlier that the term one world government is, or ought to be, preferred. Aurelio Pache once confided in his close friend Alexander Haig that he felt like Adam Weishaupt reincarnated. Pache had much of Weishaupt's brilliant ability to organize and control the Illuminati of today, and it showed through in Pache's control of NATO and formulating its policies on a global scale. Peche headed the Atlantic Institute's Economic Council for three decades while he was the chief executive officer for Giovanni Agnellis's Fiat Motor Company. Agnelli, a member of an ancient Italian black nobility family of the same name, is one of the most important members of the Committee of 300. He played a leading role in development projects in the Soviet Union. The Club of Rome is a conspiratorial umbrella organization, a marriage between Anglo-American financiers and the old black nobility families of Europe, particularly the so-called nobility of London, Venice, and Genoa. 
The key to the successful control of the world is their ability to create and manage savage economic recessions and eventual depressions. The Committee of 300 looks to social convulsions on a global scale, followed by depressions, as a softening up technique for bigger things to come, as its principal method of creating masses of people all over the world who will become its welfare recipients of the future. The committee appears to base much of its important decisions affecting mankind on the philosophy of Polish aristocrat Felix Zerzinski, who regarded mankind as being slightly above the level of cattle. As a close friend of British intelligence agent Sidney Riley, Riley was actually Zerzinski's controller during the Bolshevik Revolution's formative years. He often confided in Riley during his drinking bouts. Zerzinski was, of course, the beast who ran the Red Terror apparatus. He once told Riley, while the two were on a drinking binge, that man is of no importance. Look at what happens when you starve him. He begins to eat his dead companions to stay alive. Man is only interested in his own survival. That is all that counts. All the Spinoza stuff is a lot of rubbish. The Club of Rome has its own private intelligence agency and also borrows from David Rockefeller's Interpol. Every U.S. intelligence agency cooperates very closely with it, as does the KGB and the Mossad. The only agency that remained beyond its reach was the East German Intelligence Service, the Stasi. The Club of Rome also has its own highly organized political and economic agencies. It was they who told President Reagan to retain the services of Paul Volcker, yet another important committee of 300 member. Volcker stayed on as Federal Reserve Board Chairman, notwithstanding the faithful promise of candidate Reagan that he would dismiss him as soon as he, Reagan, was elected. The Club of Rome, after playing a key role in the Cuban Missile Crisis, attempted to sell its crisis management, the forerunner of FEMA program, to President Kennedy. Several Tavistock scientists went to see the president to explain what it meant, but the president rejected the advice they gave. The same year that Kennedy was murdered, Tavistock was back in Washington to talk with NASA. This time, the talks were successful. Tavistock was given a contract by NASA to evaluate the effect of its coming space program on American public opinion. The contract was farmed to the Stanford Research Institute and the Rand Corporation. Much of the material produced by Tavistock, Stanford, and Rand never saw the light of day and remains sealed until now. Several Senate oversight committees and subcommittees I approached to obtain information told me they had never heard of it, nor did they have the slightest idea where I might find what I was seeking. Such is the power and prestige of the Committee of 300. In 1966, I was advised by my intelligence colleagues to approach Dr. Anatole Rapoport, who had written a treatise in which the administration was said to be interested. It was a paper intended to bring an end to NASA's space program, which Rapport said had outlived its usefulness. Rapoport was quite happy to give me a copy of his paper, which, without going into fine detail, basically claimed that NASA's space program should be scrapped. NASA has too many scientists who were exerting a bad influence on America because they were always eager to lecture schools and university audiences on how rocketry worked, from construction to propulsion. Rapoport claimed that this would produce a generation of adults who would decide to become space scientists, only to find themselves redundant, as no one would need their services by the year 2000. No sooner had Rapoport's profiling report on NASA been presented to NATO by the Club of Rome than the Committee of 300 demanded action. NATO Club of Rome officials charged with urgent anti-NASA action were Harland Cleveland, Joseph Slater, Claiborne K. Pell, Walter J. Levy, George McGee, William Watts, Robert Strauss Hupa, U.S. Ambassador to NATO, and Donald Lesh. In May 1967, a meeting was organized by the Scientific and Technological Committee of the North Atlantic Assembly and the Foreign Policy Research Institute. It was called Conference on Transatlantic Imbalance and Collaboration, and it was held at Queen Elizabeth's palatial property in Deauville, France. The basic purpose and intent of the conference at Deauville was to end U.S. technological and industrial progress. Out of the conference came two books, one of which is mentioned herein, 
Brzezinski's Technotronic Era. The other was written by conference chairman Aurelio Pecce, entitled The Chasm Ahead. Pecce largely agreed with Brzezinski, but added that there world be chaos in a future world not ruled by a one-world government. In this regard, Pecce insisted that the Soviet Union must be offered a convergence with NATO, such a convergence ending in an equal partnership in a new world order with the United States. Both nations would be responsible for future crisis management and global planning. The first club of Rome's global planning contract went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, one of the premier committee of 300's research institutes. Jay Forrester and Denise Meadows were placed in charge of the project. What was their report all about? It did not differ fundamentally from what Malthus and von Hayek preached, namely the old question of not enough natural resources to go around. The Forrester Meadows report was a complete fraud. What it did not say was that man's proven inventive genius would in all likelihood work its way around shortages. Fusion energy, the deadly enemy of the Committee of 300, could be applied to creating natural resources. A fusion torch could produce from one square mile of ordinary rock enough aluminum, for example, to fill our needs for four years. Peche never tired of preaching against the nation-state and how destructive they are for the progress of mankind. He called for collective responsibility. Nationalism was a cancer on man was the theme of several important speeches delivered by Peche. His close friend, Irvin Laszlo, produced a work in 1977 in a similar vein which was called Goals of Mankind, a landmark study for the Club of Rome. The entire position paper was a vitriolic attack on industrial expansion and urban growth. Throughout these years, Kissinger, as the designated contact man, kept in close touch with Moscow on behalf of the RIIA. Global modeling papers were regularly shared with Kissinger's friends in the Kremlin. With regard to the Third World, the Club of Rome's Harland Cleveland prepared a report which was the height of cynicism. At the time, Cleveland was United States ambassador to NATO. Essentially, the paper said it would be up to Third World nations to decide among themselves which populations should be eliminated. As Pache later wrote, based on the Cleveland report, Damaged by conflicting policies of three major countries and blocs, roughly patched up here and there, the existing international economic order is visibly coming apart at the seams. The prospect of the necessity of the recourse to triage, deciding who must be saved, is a very grim one indeed. But if, lamentably, events should come to such a pass, the right to make such decisions cannot be left to just a few nations because it would lend themselves to ominous power over life of the world's hungry. In this is found the committee policy of deliberately starving African nations to death, as evidenced in the sub-Sahara nations. This was cynicism at its worst, because the Committee of 300 had already abrogated the decisions of life and death unto itself, and Pache knew it. He had previously so indicated in his book, Limits of Growth, Peche completely dismissed industrial and agricultural progress and in its place demanded that the world come under one coordinating council, to wit, the Club of Rome and its NATO institutions, in a one-world government. Natural resources would have to be allocated under the auspices of global planning. Nation-states could either accept Club of Rome domination or else survive by the law of the jungle and fight to survive. In its first test case, Meadows and Forrester planned the 1973 Arab-Israeli War on behalf of the RIIA to sharply bring home to the world that natural resources like petroleum would in the future come under global planners' control, meaning, of course, under the control of the Committee of 300. Tavistock Institute called for a consultation with Peche, to which McGeorge Bundy, Homer Perlmutter, and Dr. Alexander King were invited. From London, Peche traveled to the White House where he met with the President and his cabinet, followed by a visit to the State Department where he conferred with the Secretary of State, the State Department's Intelligence Service, and State's Policy Planning Council. Thus, from the very beginning, the United States government was fully aware of the Committee of 300's plans for this country. 
That should answer the often asked question, why would our government allow the Club of Rome to operate in a subversive manner in the United States? Volcker's economic and monetary policies were a reflection of those of Sir Geoffrey Howe, Chancellor of the Exchequer and member of the Committee of 300. This serves to illustrate how Britain has controlled the United States, beginning from soon after the War of 1812, and continues to exercise control over this country through the policies of the Committee of 300. What are the goals of the secret elite group, the inheritors of Illuminism, Mariah Conquering Wind, the cult of Dionysius, the cult of Isis, Catharism, Bogomilism? This elite group that also calls itself the Olympians, they truly believe they are equal in power and stature to the legendary gods of Olympus, who have, like Lucifer their god, set themselves above our true god, absolutely believe they have been charged with implementing the following by divine right. 1. A one-world government new world order with a unified church and monetary system under their direction. Not many people are aware that the one world government began setting up its church in the 1920 S1930 ES, for they realized the need for a religious belief inherent in mankind to have an outlet and therefore set up a church body to channel that belief in the direction they desired. 2. The utter destruction of all national identity and national pride. 3. The destruction of religion, and more especially the Christian religion, with the one exception, their own creation mentioned above. 4. Control of each and every person through means of mind control and what Brzezinski called technotronics, which would create human-like robots and a system of terror beside which Felix Zerzinski's Red Terror will look like children at play. 5. An end to all industrialization and the production of nuclear-generated electric power in what they call the post-industrial zero-growth society. Exempted are the computer and service industries. United States industries that remain will be exported to countries such as Mexico, where abundant slave labor is available. Unemployables in the wake of industrial destruction will either become opium heroin and or cocaine addicts, or become statistics in the elimination process we know today as Global 2000. 6. Legalization of drugs and pornography. 7. Depopulation of large cities according to the trial run carried out by the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia. It is interesting to note that Pol Pot's genocidal plans were drawn up here in the United States by one of the Club of Rome's research foundations. It is also interesting that the committee is presently seeking to reinstate the Pol Pot butchers in Cambodia. 8. Suppression of all scientific development except for those deemed beneficial by the committee. Especially targeted is nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Particularly hated are the fusion experiments presently being scorned and ridiculed by the committee and its jackals of the press. Development of the fusion torch would blow the committee's conception of limited natural resources right out of the window. A fusion torch properly used could create unlimited, untapped natural resources from the most ordinary substances. Fusion torch uses are legion and would benefit mankind in a manner which is as yet not even remotely comprehended by the public. 9. Cause by means of limited wars in the advanced countries and by means of starvation and diseases in third world countries, the death of three billion people by the year 2000, people they call useless eaters. The Committee of 300 commissioned Cyrus Vance to write a paper on this subject of how best to bring about such genocide. The paper was produced under the title The Global 2000 Report and was accepted and approved for action by President Carter for and on behalf of the U.S. government and accepted by Edwin Muskie, then Secretary of State. Under the terms of the Global 2000 Report, the population of the United States is to be reduced by 100 million by the year 2050. 10. To weaken the moral fiber of the nation and to demoralize workers in the labor class by creating mass unemployment. As jobs dwindle due to the post-industrial zero-growth policies introduced by the Club of Rome, demoralized and discouraged workers will resort to alcohol and drugs. 
The youth of the land will be encouraged by means of rock music and drugs to rebel against the status quo, thus undermining and eventually destroying the family unit. In this regard, the Committee of 300 commissioned Tavistock Institute to prepare a blueprint as to how this could be achieved. Tavistock directed Stanford Research to undertake the work under the direction of Professor Willis Harmon. This work later became known as the Aquarian Conspiracy, 11, to keep people everywhere from deciding their own destinies by means of one created crisis after another and then managing such crises. This will confuse and demoralize the population to the extent where faced with too many choices, apathy on a massive scale will result. In the case of the United States, an agency for crisis management is already in place. It is called the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, whose existence I first disclosed in 1980. There will be more on FEMA as we proceed. 12. To introduce new cults and continue to boost those already functioning, which includes rock music gangsters, such as the filthy, degenerate Mick Jagger's Rolling Stones, a gangster group much favored by European black nobility, and all of the Tavistock-created rock groups, which began with the Beatles. To continue to build up the cult of Christian fundamentalism begun by the British East India Company's servant, Darby, which will be misused to strengthen the Zionist state of Israel through identifying with the Jews through the myth of God's chosen people, and by donating very substantial amounts of money to what they mistakenly believe is a religious cause in the furtherance of Christianity. 14. To press for the spread of religious cults, such as the Muslim Brotherhood, Muslim Fundamentalism, the Sikhs, and to carry out experiments of the Jim Jones and Son of Sam type of murders. It is worth noting that the late Ayatollah Khomeini was a creation of British Intelligence Military Intelligence Division 6, commonly known as M16, as I reported in my 1985 work, What Really Happened in Iran. 15. To export religious liberation ideas around the world so as to undermine all existing religions, but more especially, the Christian religion. This began with Jesuit liberation theology, which brought about the downfall of the Somoza family rule in Nicaragua and which is today destroying E.I. Salvador, now 25 years into a civil war, Costa Rica and Honduras. One very active entity engaged in so-called liberation theology is the communist-oriented Mary Knoll Mission. This accounts for the extensive media attention to the murder of four of Mary Knoll's so-called nuns in E.I. Salvador a few years ago. The four nuns were communist subversive agents, and their activities were widely documented by the government of E.I. Salvador. The United States press and news media refused to give any space or coverage to the mass of documentation in possession of the Salvadorian government, documentation which proves what the Mary Knoll mission nuns were doing in the country. Mary Knoll is in service in many countries and played a leading role in bringing communism to Rhodesia, Mozambique, Angola, and South Africa. 16. To cause a total collapse of the world's economies and engender total political chaos. 17. To take control of all foreign and domestic policies of the United States. 18. To give the fullest support to supranational institutions such as the United Nations, UN, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, the Bank of International Settlements, BIS, the World Court, and, as far as possible, make local institutions of lesser effect by gradually phasing them out or bringing them under the mantle of the United Nations. 19. Penetrate and subvert all governments and work from within them to destroy the sovereign integrity of nations represented by them. 20. Organize a worldwide terrorist apparatus and negotiate with terrorists whenever terrorist activities take place. It will be recalled that it was Bettino Craxi who persuaded the Italian and U.S. governments to negotiate with the Red Brigade's kidnappers of Prime Minister Moro and General Dozier. As an aside, General Dozier is under orders not to talk about what happened to him. Should he break that silence, he will no doubt be made a horrible example of in the manner in which Kissinger dealt with Aldo Moro, Ali Budo, and Gen Errol Zia-ul-Haq. 21. 
take control of education in America with the intent and purpose of utterly and completely destroying it. Much of these goals, which I first enumerated in 1969, have since been achieved or are well on their way to being achieved. Of special interest in the Committee of 300 program is the core of their economic policy, which is largely based on the teachings of Malthus, the son of an English country parson who was pushed to prominence by the British East India Company, upon which the Committee of 300 is modeled. Malthus maintained that man's progress is tied to the Earth's natural ability to support a given number of people, beyond which point Earth's limited resources would rapidly be depleted. Once these natural resources have been consumed, it will be impossible to replace them. Hence, Malthus observed, it is necessary to limit populations within the boundaries of decreasing natural resources. It goes without saying that the elite will not allow themselves to be threatened by a burgeoning population of useless eaters. Hence, culling must be practiced. As I have previously stated, culling is going on today, using the methods mandated in the Global 2000 Report. All economic plans of the committee meet at the crossroads of Malthus and Frederick von Hayek, another doom-and-gloom economist who is sponsored by the Club of Rome. The Austrian-born von Hayek has long been under the control of David Rockefeller, and von Hayek theories are fairly widely accepted in the United States. According to von Hayek, the United States economic platform must be based on a. urban black markets, b. small Hong Kong-type industries utilizing sweatshop labor, c. the tourist trade, d free enterprise zones where speculators can operate unhindered and where the drug trade can flourish, E, end of all industrial activity, and F, close down all nuclear energy plants. Von Hayek's ideas dovetail perfectly with those of the Club of Rome, which is perhaps why he is so well promoted in right-wing circles in this country. The mantle of Von Hayek is being passed to a new, younger economist, Jeffrey Sachs, who was sent to Poland to take up where Von Hayek left off. It will, he recalled, that the Club of Rome organized the Polish economic crisis, which led to political destabilization of the country. The exact same economic planning, if one dare call it that, will be forced upon Russia. But if widespread opposition is encountered, the old price support system will quickly be restored. The Committee of 300 ordered the Club of Rome to use Polish nationalism as a tool to destroy the Catholic Church and pave the way for Russian troops to reoccupy the country. The Solidarity Movement was a creation of the Committee of 300's Zbigniew Brzezinski, who chose the name for the Trade Union and selected its office holders and organizers. Solidarity is no labor movement, although Gdansk shipyard workers were used to launch it, but rather, it was a high-profile political organization created to bring forced changes in preparation for the advent of the one-world government. Most of Solidarity's leaders were descendants of Bolshevik Jews from Odessa and were not noted for hating communism. This helps to understand the saturation coverage provided by the American news media. Professor Sachs has taken the process a step further, ensuring economic slavery for a Poland recently freed from the domination of the USSR. Poland will now become the economic slave of the United States. All that has happened is that the master has changed. Brzezinski is the author of a book that should have been read by every American interested in the future of this country. Entitled The Technotronic Era, it was commissioned by the Club of Rome. The book is an open announcement of the manner and methods to be used to control the United States in the future. It also gave notice of cloning and robotoids, that is, people who acted like people and who seemed to be people, but who were not. Brzezinski, speaking for the Committee of 300, said the United States was moving into an era unlike any of its predecessors. We were moving toward a technotronic era that could easily become a dictatorship. I reported fully on the technotronic era in 1981 and mentioned it in my newsletters a number of times. Brzezinski went on to say that our society is now in an information revolution based on amusement focus, spectator spectacles, saturation coverage by television of sporting events, which provide an opiate for an increasingly purposeless mass. Was Brzezinski another seer and a prophet? 
Could he see into the future? The answer is no. What he wrote in his book was simply copied from the Committee of 300's blueprint given to the Club of Rome for execution. Isn't it true that by 1991 we already have a purposeless mass of citizens? We could say that 30 million unemployed and 4 million homeless people are a purposeless mass, or at least the nucleus of one. In addition to religion, the opiate of the masses which Lenin and Marx acknowledged was needed, we now have the opiates of mass spectator sport, unbridled sexual lusts, rock music, and a whole new generation of drug addicts. Mindless sex and an epidemic of drug usage was created to distract people from what is happening all around them. In The Technotronic Era, Brzezinski talks about the masses as if people are some inanimate object, which is possibly how we are viewed by the Committee of 300. He continually refers to the necessity of controlling us masses. At one point, he lets the cat out of the bag. At the same time, the capacity to assert social and political control over the individual will vastly increase. It will soon be possible to assert almost continuous control over every citizen and to maintain up-to-date files, containing even the most personal details about health and personal behavior of every citizen in addition to the more customary data. These files will be subject to instantaneous retrieval by the authorities. Power will gravitate into the hands of those who control information. Our existing institutions will be supplanted by pre-crisis management institutions, the task of which will be to identify in advance likely social crises and to develop programs to cope with them. This describes the structure of FEMA, which came much later.